Welcome to EdTech Du Jour. I'm Dr. Melissa Callback, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Andrew Rice from Queens College at the University of Cambridge. And we know that many people think that certain disciplines and courses cannot effectively be facilitated online. However, Dr. Rice has taught Java and Prolog programming courses online successfully. So today I'd like to chat about how you designed and delivered these courses and if you could start with describing the structure of your course and what you did to shift from the face-to-face -face environment. So um, Java and Prolog both are programming languages and so you know, really the, the best way to learn is to, is to do it. And so trying to teach these things in a traditional lecture-based scenario is really not an effective way of trying to actually get students to learn best. So what we did was we took the took the course that in its existing form and, and just redesigned it completely to work with workbooks rather than, than with a lecturer. And um, the, other, the other sort of problem that you have with, with programming courses is that you really want the students to be able to build a big artifact, you want them to be able to, to really build a program that has some meaning. And so if you're always writing small toy examples all the time, then you know, there's really no sense of sort of progress. So the other sort of new thing we did was we, we built a online testing system so that the students can write some code and then the, the computer itself can say you know which bits are right which bits are wrong and also give some diagnostic feedback back so if you make a mistake you can you can fix it in, in some way or another and so this means from an assessment viewpoint we can uh, set much bigger programming tasks because they don't need to be marked by a teacher anymore they can be they can be assessed by the by the computer system and then and then the students can progress through and actually build you know a meaningful piece of software at the end the idea of workbooks is that if you if you are already a good programmer or you're already having you know you've already got some experience then you can you can use a workbook and go forward at your own pace and you know it's impossible to fast forward a lecture but with a workbook you can skip ahead go back to seek some material that you that you maybe didn't understand and, and then go forward again from there absolutely and it sounds like experiential learning at its finest and you described how technology allowed you to automate some tasks and al how did that allow the instructor to have more time to engage with the students well so if you think about if you think about sort of teaching and learning there are there are some things that only a teacher can do so um, if a student has an opinion or a thought about something and they explain it to me then I can ask them some questions about it challenge them and they can think get to think about what they what they really mean but other other aspects can be automated and so the sort of theme we've been taking is trying to automate all the bits that we can and thus leaving the instructor free to do the bits that a computer can't do so if you take software testing as an example I can write a program that will test your your program see which inputs work and see which ones don't and then that leaves me free as an instructor to ask why did you decide to do it this way maybe you should think about some better comments that's a, a classic problem with with new programmers or or any sorts of those sort of more sort of stylistic things that really a computer struggles to make sort of meaningful feedback on and did you provide that feedback on the assignments or on a discussion forum so those were done on, on the assignments themselves, so the, um, the, the students write, write their program and then obviously you can look at it from a sort of a functional viewpoint and does it do what it's supposed to do, that's what the computer can test, but you can also look at how well it was written and what properties it has as a piece of software and that needs the person, so you, the person then looks at those assignments to, to then give the feedback that they need. I mean that doesn't actually have to even be done in person with a, with a computer program, you could right. imagine annotating and then sending back comments. And, uh, but for the moment, it, that's something that we've done sort of face to face with the students. And how did you ensure balance between shallow learning and deep learning within those assignments and assessments as far as how you designed your course? Well, so um, shallow, and, shallow and deep is a, is a good area because you know, really with higher education, what we're thinking about is trying to teach our students to put the pieces together for themselves. And so you have to make sure that the questions you ask and the assignments you set are really testing that and really helping students to do it. And so um, I was reading just the other day, there's a, a really neat paper that talks about this, this uh, framework called ICAP, which is about sort of a progression through maybe sort of different stages of thinking about learning. And a student moves from, say, passive to active to constructive and then to um, interactive. And maybe if, if, I, if I do an example, so um, if you think about, say, somebody who's learning, being tutored on maths. So um, at the passive level, um, if you were the student, then I might be writing out 
the answer for you, and, and you're paying attention, but you're not really doing anything. You're just you're just watching what I do, and that would that would be passive kind of learning. And then to take it up a level to active, maybe instead of me writing, I give you the pen, um, but I, but I sort of tell you how to write out the proof. And then to go to go any further than that is about getting the students to really start creating knowledge for themselves and the pieces that they know. So constructive. A uh, constructive mode of engagement would be maybe you would be making decisions for yourself about what you want to do next, what pieces and what theorems you want to apply. And then a, um, a uh, interactive kind of approach would be maybe we set out together to define the problem that we're going to try and prove and what are the boundaries on it and we maybe discuss that before you actually then start doing the proof. And the interesting thing I think is that you, it's good to move the students through the levels so you start off maybe passive but then you sort of move upwards. So what we did, this was with the prologue course, was went through all of the work that we set and tried to tag all of our questions, some of them which were, were they, were they just requiring book work, were they requiring these more deeper forms of engagement? And so we actually marked them all up. And that worked pretty well for us because it meant as teachers we could try and see whether we got the balance right, because you want some of each kind. But it was also good for the students because they could really understand before they started a question what was going to be expected of them. You know, if you're feeling really tired, don't take on an open question that's going to take a lot of interaction. You know, just do the do the passive stuff, and then you can come back to it another time. So it's been a huge success for us. And it sounds like you had a really good way to measure and look at the holistic approach to the design of your course, looking at your course map and understanding where you had maybe a lot of uh, balance in one area and potentially gaps in another. And so it's a really good way to streamline everything. And I really appreciate you sharing your strategies for teaching Java online, and thank you so much for joining us My today. My pleasure. My pleasure.